Steve Henry, who's going to tell us the latest on mice. Steve was telling me he tours around the countryside looking for mice, and unfortunately he's been able to find quite a few. But Steve's background is he's a research officer from CSIRO, Health and Biosecurity, and he's worked for a number of years, 25 years or so, looking at introduced animals on Australian ecosystems. And obviously, from our point of view, um, mice are one of the very serious um, introduced species that potentially impact on our cropping programs. And he's been monitoring mice in Australian cropping systems in Queensland, New South Wales, Victoria and South Australia for the fa past five years. And he's currently involved in collecting data for a GRDC project on mice. So if you can uh, welcome Steve Henry from CSIRO. Thanks, Carolyn. Um, I'm just going to talk very briefly for about five minutes about the work that we do. Um, but up front, I'd like to, to acknowledge that this is a GRDC-funded project, and without their support, we wouldn't be out there collecting information about mice and providing feedback to farmers. Um, so the project is uh, surveillance and forecasts for mice outbreaks in Australian cropping systems. But before I start on that, just a little bit of background about mice. Mouse plagues occur in, in uh, growing regions of Australia since 1904. Um, they occur irregularly in southern cropping zones, but in Queensland, uh, in the different cropping system up there, they occur every one or two years, so they're, they're way more frequent up there. And no one knows exactly what drives those outbreaks. Um, they're characterised by a concurrent widespread increase in densities to greater than 1,000 mice per hectare. But based on last season's outbreaks, we'd start to sort of question that widespread nature of, of the mouse outbreaks because there was a lot of talk about the patchy nature of last year's outbreak. Um, after a mouse plague, they tend to crash away to incredibly low numbers and there's, there's no uh, well understood reason for that happening. We think that it's a combination of them running out of food, disease and cannibalisation and those sorts of things. Um, and of course, you all know they cause significant economic damage. Um, the data that you see on the left-hand side is data from Wolpiup. And you can see that over a period from 1983 through to 2004, um, the frequency of outbreaks, and I'm hoping there's a pointer on this, and there is. And you can see at the start of each outbreak, there's that little blip there in the spring of each year. And what I'd like to say is if we go out to here, which is where we are at the moment, we're actually seeing exactly that little blip now, except slightly higher. Now, that, that little blip is always associated with, with significant rainfall events. Uh, and this year, we're seeing the sort of rainfall in the lead up to, to spring that we think will lead to significant numbers of mice. Um, the monitoring that we do is um, through most of the eastern states and we've got some agronomy companies doing monitoring for us in the western states and central cropping systems in New South Wales doing some monitoring for us there. But all of the, the green dots on the map are rapid assessment sites and all of the red dots are trapping sites. Now at the benchmark trapping sites we do capture mark recapture which uh, is the gold standard for, for monitoring mouse populations. It gives us an indication of population size and reproductive status of the mice. Really important at this time of the year to know when they start breeding and how many are there because the population size and the date at which they start breeding determines where they're going to get to over the summer and into the next autumn. Um, so yes, at those red sites we do trapping because we've got a whole lot of historic data at those sites. The green sites, we do rapid assessment, which are uh, active burrow counts along 100 metre transects and chew card counts. Um, so why are mouse plagues a problem? We know they cause am economic damages, damage to all stages of the cropping system, but particularly at sowing. Uh, they cause damage to infrastructure, uh, they cause uh, significant social impacts. There's almost as, 
it's one of those sort of understated impacts of, of uh, mouse plagues is the, is the actual social impact that they have on people in rural communities. Um, and when I talk to people, no one ever forgets a mouse plague. No one ever. Um, they cause environmental problems. And of course, in not only in cropping systems, but in intensive animal systems, they're causing significant damage. And you can just see the damage, oh, sorry. You can, oh. so you can see the damage that was caused to a, a live pig from mice. Um, current control measures are zinc phosphide, and it's the only measure of control that you have on a broad scale basis. Um, it's a com commercially prepared grain bait. Um, it's spread at one kilogram per hectare, which is three grains per square metre, which is greater than 22,000 lethal doses per hectare. It's one of those cases where more is not better. If you're spreading at a kilogram per hectare, that should be well and truly enough to kill mice at plague proportions. Um, the other advantages of zinc phosphide is that there are fewer apparent non-target issues. But the effect, part of the effectiveness of zinc phosphide is it relies on farmers being aware of the emerging problem and being proactive about control strategies. Uh, and of course, it's the only bait that you're allowed to, to spread on a broad scale. Um, so it's timely because I've just finished doing monitoring from Walpi up through to Pinaroo and from Hopeton down to Horsham. So I can give you a bit of an update about what we're finding. Um, so along the run from Hopeton to Horsham and, and the Pinaroo to Walpi up run, we do a, a property every 10 kilometres. And at each of those properties, we do uh, 10 chew cards along a 100 metre transect. And then we do 400 metres of active burrow counts um, and what we've been seeing this year that's different to preceding years is that although we're not seeing very much actual damage to the crop, our chew cards have been absolutely hammered. Um, and so we're also not finding a hell of a lot of active burrows as well, but obviously the mice are there in the crops because most of my chew cards are being completely eaten. And over the five years that I've been monitoring mice in this area, and we go back to the same locations each year, I haven't seen that level of activity on chew cards in the past. Now, there's a couple of things that might be driving that. It may be that we've hit a phase in the crop that means there's not very much food available. And if looking around on the ground, I'm not seeing any ungerminated grain or anything like that. So, and the crops are pretty clean. There's not very much, I haven't seen very much ryegrass out there. And so it might be that the mice are actually happier to stay on the ground and eat my chew cards than climb up stems and chop off canola heads or climb up and chew at nodes. So it may be that the, the food availability is really low at the moment. Now, if that is the case and you guys are, s are concerned about the number of mice you have, now might be quite a good time to do that application of bait. Because if there's not very much available food around and you provide them with a food source that's slightly novel and they don't have to climb up and risk predation by climbing up stems to get it, it might be quite an effective time to do it. The other thing I'm hearing from farmers is they've been really happy with the results they've got from aerially spread canola bait spread from the air, sorry, from zinc phosphide bait spread from the air in canola crops. Um, so that's where we're at at the moment. Um, and I think that's probably enough of me talking only to acknowledge that these are the people that work on the project and I'm happy to take questions. I'd like to ask a question, do we breed our own mice or do they come in from our neighbour's place? In other words, if you've got your mice clean on your place, are you safe from infection? Uh, look, there's a, it's always been considered that you should ap apply any sort of vertebrate pest control on as broad a scale as you possibly can to stop immigration from, from the edges. However, you, with, any, with, with mice, they're probably always there at low population densities, regardless of how hard you've worked to control them. 
And so when you provide conditions that are as favourable as these at the moment, so we've got, got that we've got a higher number of mice that have survived through the winter than would normally have survived, and we've got average to better than average crops providing a whole lot of shelter and food, then the rate of increase is going to be really, really high. So mice start breeding at six weeks of age, and then they can have a litter every 20 days after that, and a single pair of mice can give rise to 500 offspring in a season. So it doesn't take very many mice to create a, a hell of a lot of mice. Uh, if you create a hole, having said that, if you create, oops, sorry, if you create a hole in an ecosystem, animals will move into that hole to fill it. So there is a chance that if, if you had animals on your neighbours' places at higher than normal densities, they would then move into those lower density areas. But it wouldn't happen very quickly. Steve, I've got a question. Sorry, just more about that rate where you had three grains per metre squared and you're saying going higher does not give you any benefit. Um, I think we had this discussion a couple of years ago about how many grains does a mice actually eat before it dies. I know there might be the lethal dose on the grain, but how long does it take for it to die? And probably anecdotal experiences show that if you put higher rates this year, you, once you didn't have to come back again two weeks after. And what's your comments on that? Is that you still stand by that comment, given that you know if mice can eat more than three grains at a time, then it certainly is a rate with a number population. So I think I think the the initial work that was done on zinc phosphide in relatively high populations suggested that after an application of one kilogram a hectare at a, per hectare, ninety five percent of the mice in that population were killed by that by that dose. Now, we're starting to hear, and, and initially farmers were really, really happy with the way zinc phosphide worked, and as time has passed, we're getting more and more reports about the effectiveness of zinc phosphide, and more and more guys saying, I've had to go back again and again to get a result. So there's a range, there's a range of factors that might be affecting that. So one of them might be the amount of food that's left in the system, and so you might be spreading at a kilogram per hectare, but why would they switch to zinc phosphide on wheat when they're used to eating barley? So animals are all about eating what's safe. They know it's safe to eat barley. Why would they switch? So there's a whole range of variables that we need to start to tease out to get at those issues. Um, at the moment, we're looking at doing a really short-term bait substrate trial in South Australia to look at zinc phosphide spread on different bait substrates in different cropping systems to see if we get better results from those different bait substrates. So we're starting to look at different ways and different better strategies so that we do get good results from one application. When you're doing your surveys and you're determining whether burrows are active or not, how do you do that? Okay. Yeah, it's... Um, you, you get an eye for an active burrow, but um, what we do is w when we walk our 100 metre transect, um, we've got a, a shaker can of, um, of corn flour, and I just shake a little bit of corn flour onto the entrance of the burrow, and I come back the next day when I'm picking up my chew cards, and you can see that they've been trundling in and out of the burrow over the corn flour. But I reckon you guys, most of the time, you would be able to pick an active burrow from an inactive burrow, looking at signs like spider webs, uh, vegeta uh, vegetative detritus blowing into burrows and those sorts of things. Mice are pretty clean and tidy critters and they'll clean out burrow entrances and you'll see paths going in and out. So you've probably got a pretty good idea. But if you are counting burrows per 100 metres to try and work out how many mice you've got, it's really important when you do that transect to make sure you're only counting burrows that fall within that one metre wide transect. Because if you add a burrow in that's just outside that, that one metre and you walk 100 metres, so you're getting burrows per 100 square metres, if you're getting one burrow per 100 square metres, that's 100 burrows per hectare. And if you're adding one in, you're adding a significant number of burrows. So it's, it's important to be very careful to maintain that one metre width on your transects because you can blow your numbers of mice out of the, out of the water. Um, just a question on uh, baiting double tap type. So coming in once with bait and then coming in again for a clean-up, what's the optimum t uh, space gap to get the best effect? Okay. Uh, 
Um, one, of, one of the things that we need to be really careful of is beta version and the issues associated with sublethal doses. So in any, in any population of mice, you'll get some animals that will eat a, a, a lethal dose and they'll die, but a proportion of the population will eat what we call a sublethal dose. So they might only eat half a grain or try it and then start to feel sick. And they, start, and they go, it's, my colleague uh, equates it to eating a dodgy curry. And so <laughs> once you've had a dodgy curry, it's a while before you go back and try another curry. And so we think that you should be waiting about six weeks. But I'm, I'm cautious about counselling in that if, if you've had, uh, if you've gone with a poison event and you're really worried that you haven't made a significant impact, then don't sit there sustaining damage for an extra six weeks before you go again. You need to be sort of on the ground looking at what's happening and saying, all right, well, maybe I, you know, I can clean up in six weeks if there's not much damage there, if you think you've done a pretty reasonable job with the first application.